I'd like to reflect on my last 50 years of thinking about three overlapping revolutions, sometimes goes by the letters GNR, G for genetics, which is really biotechnology. That revolution is just taking off. N for nanotechnology and R for robotics, which is artificial intelligence. When I was 14, I discovered artificial intelligence, which is really brand new. It had only been named in 1956 at a Dartmouth conference. Uh, where it, got, it was called Artificial Intelligence by John McCarthy. Five or six years ago, though, we had only gotten to three or four levels. And the big accusation against the AI field is you guys can't even tell the difference between a dog and a cat. Well, it turns out the, the essence of a dog and a cat is pretty subtle. And it's actually at level 15. You need a 15-level neural net to tell the difference between a dog and a cat. And the reason we were only up to three or four levels is not that we couldn't actually connect 15 or 20 or 100 levels. That's trivial to do. But there was a mathematical problem. The information would kind of disintegrate after three or four levels. There was a group of mathematicians, including Jeff Hinton, who's a colleague of mine at Google, who solved that mathematical problem, enabled the information to stay stable, and now you could have any number of levels. We have now 100-level neural nets that can distinguish between thousands of different categories and do it better than humans. And this uh, is what underlies the tremendous surge of interest in artificial intelligence, combined with one other thing, which is the exponential growth of computation. Well, the amount of computation for the same cost has been doubling every year, and I call that the law of accelerating returns. Before Moore's law, there were no chips back then, but they were making the vacuum tube smaller each year to keep this going. Finally, they reached the limit. They couldn't shrink the vacuum tubes and keep the vacuum. Around 1959, that was the end of the shrinking of vacuum tubes, but it was not the end of the law of accelerating returns. Just went to the fourth paradigm, transistors, and finally chips. And chips are actually slowing down. We're now going to the sixth paradigm, which is computing in three dimensions. This is the first revolution I mentioned in the three overlapping revolutions, biotechnology. It was enabled by the Genome Project, which, as I mentioned, was a perfect exponential. We were doubling the amount of genetic data every year. The cost came down by half every year. That continued since the end of the Genome Project. That first genome cost a billion dollars. We're now down to a few thousand dollars. We are growing organs with the patient's own DNA. I'm involved with a company where we are growing hearts, lungs, and kidneys, installing them successfully in animals. This is coming to a human near you soon. Uh, I'd say within five years, this will be a successful experimental technology for humans. Within 10 years, it will be an established therapy. Another exponential progression is miniaturization. We're shrinking technology, rate of about 130 volume per decade. Uh, we ultimately will have blood cell size devices. Now, there already are precursors of this. There are actually little capsules that can be directed in various ways to deliver medication, let's say, to a tumor and not to healthy tissue. And, that exists today. Ultimately, these will be uh, robotic devices with s computers and AI and uh, sensors and storage tanks. I actually have a somewhat different model of how the brain works than these deep neural nets. The brain is not one big massive neural net. I actually describe it as a series of little modules. Each module can recognize a pattern. It can learn a pattern. It can remember that pattern, it can recognize it, it can recognize it even in a different context. These modules are organized in a hierarchy, and we create that hierarchy with our own thinking. The recent accomplishments of AI are not so narrow. Go is considered a deep game of judgment and pattern recognition. Driving cars is not so narrow. This happened six years ago. Computer defeated the best players at Jeopardy. That's a very broad game, which involves deep understanding of language and knowledge. After listening to your presentation, you're incredibly positive about the future. Everything you say points in an upward trajectory that things will continue to get better. The reality is things are getting better, but people don't realize that. There was a poll taken recently <laughs> of 24,000 people in 26 countries, and they were asked, is poverty worldwide getting better or worse? 90% 
said incorrectly that it's getting worse. Only 1% said correctly that it's come down by half in the last 20 years. People's algorithm for whether things are getting better or worse is how often do I hear about something good versus something bad? And it's actually not a very good way mm. to measure things. Do you think our humanity is evolving along with our technology or our ability to, to show empathy, for example? Is that evolving at the same speed as, as our ability to acquire knowledge? The number of democracies in the world, you could count on the fingers of one hand a century ago. Mm -hmm. Now, the whole world is not a democracy, but there are actually quite a few dozens of countries that are good democracies, and it has become a consensus as the right way to organize humanity. Despite appearances, there is actually a worldwide consensus on how we should treat each other. And the worldwide communication we have, I think, amplifies our ability to be empathetic to other types of people. What do you worry about? In the uh, age of spiritual machines, I wrote about how technology has always been a double-edged sword. Fire kept us warm, cooked our food, but also burned down our houses. Every technology has been used for creative and destructive purposes. Forty years ago, there was a conference uh, in California, the Asilomar Conference, on biotechnology ethics, because some visionaries said, wow, this technology is going to overcome disease, but it could also be used by a bioterrorist to create a new virus that's deadly and communicable and create a new super weapon. There is great promise, but also peril, just like any other technology, these can be used for good or destructive purposes. Uh, I'm optimistic we can keep them safe, but I think that's actually the highest priority issue for humanity. Do you see a time when our machines will um, become conscious and when they will think the way we do? Well, I, I am uh, a believer that consciousness is not dependent on the physical substrate that the intelligent process runs on. So. I mean, there are philosophers like John Searle at the University of Berkeley, right. California at Berkeley who think you, that a mind has to be biological. And if it's not squirting biological neurotransmitters, it can't be conscious. So that's his philosophical viewpoint. So my philosophical leap of faith is if it can act in the way that we associate with conscious beings, and we assume that humans are conscious, at least most humans seem most to be conscious. Most of them are. <laughs> not, not all of them, but... <laughs> Uh, and if an entity can really appear convincingly like that, then I would uh, accept it as being conscious. Mm -hmm. So that's the essence of the Turing test, that if you could have an AI that's actually running on a computer that can convince you uh, that it's conscious uh, in a dialogue, and it, uh, this makes the assumption that human language is a, uh, requires all of human intelligence, and I go along with that. Uh, then I would say that that entity is conscious. And no, no computer has done that. I've predicted that that'll happen by 2029. Uh, and I would say that if an entity is really convincing with all the subtle cues that we associate with human intelligence, uh, then, we, then I would accept it as conscious. And if we don't accept it, they'll get mad at us and they'll be very smart, so we won't want, we won't want that to happen. Do you think we're going to get to a place where we're going to live forever? Well, I can never come to you and say, I've done it. I've lived forever, because it's never forever. Right. Um, I do think we'll be able to indefinitely extend our longevity. Nothing is certain. You can still be hit by the proverbial bus tomorrow. Uh, we're working on that, too, with self-driving vehicles. <laughs> um, so I'm optimistic, but, you know, there. We have existential dangers like nuclear weapons, um, and that's not an information technology, unfortunately. Um, so nothing is certain, but uh, I'm optimistic that we can get to a point where we can indefinitely uh, extend our longevity and address the things that, that cut our lives short.